So welcome everyone. Um, as you know, it's a very sad week for us here. Uh, the last uh, two weeks, uh, we've lost our, our champion, Peter Carr. Um, but the good news is we're continuing his tradition started in 2016, at the BQR, BQE seminar series, which he's been very, um, he was very proud of and has, has spearheaded and caused it to grow and get a lot of attention in the years since, since that time. Um, this week, we're, we're proud to present uh, Laura Leal. Uh, her title of her paper is Optimal Execution with Quadratic Variation Inventories. Um, obviously a popular topic, but maybe not with undergraduates. Uh, luckily, most of the people here will be able to follow the, follow the talk. Um, Laura Leal is a final year PhD student in the, uh, the Orphe Department, the Operations Research and Financial Engineering Department at Princeton University. Her recent interests um, include high frequency finance, machine learning, deep neural networks, optimization, uh, and econometric methods used to study high frequency trading data. Uh, the main topics that she's addressed include optimal execution, market making, identification of institutional activity, and tail risk. So please join me, join me in silently welcoming uh, Laura Leal. By the way, uh, she has mentioned that she will accept questions during the talk uh, or at the end either way. Thank you very much. Laura? Thank you. And thanks everyone for being here. Uh, so this paper is part of uh, is one of the chapters in my thesis. Uh, the optimal execution problem is a problem of a large trader that has a very big order to execute. If they just dump the order in the market, they will get terrible execution in terms of uh, how much cash they're going to get, but also uh, in terms of they'll probably be fired for disrupting market activity. So this, this problem is essential if you're a large trader uh, in, a, in asset management, um, hedge funds, um, and in general, if you have large orders. So it's, it's not for um, the GameStop crowd, it's for institutional traders. And quadratic variation inventories, uh, we're gonna show that um, we have a diffusion term to be used in the modeling of the inventory process of the agent, meaning how much, uh, the inventory process is just how much in stocks they're holding throughout a, a trading day, for example. Uh, this is joint work with Professor Rene Carmona, who's my advisor in Orphe. And I hope you have, will have a great time uh, in this presentation. And let me know if you have any questions whatsoever. So first we'll motivate quadratic variation inventories. And this is coming directly from the data. We're gonna see uh, with our bare eyes what's going on. Um, and then we cannot just say, oh, well, I see it. We have to prove that, it's, uh, that what we see is real. So we're gonna do statistical tests uh, in high frequency econometrics uh, for the presence or rather the absence of these quadratic variation inventories um, for both regular and asynchronous data. So regular would be uh, binned every one minute, every five minutes, uh, and asynchronous would be on the trade clock. So every time a trade happens, uh, we record the, the data. And given that we show that a diffusion component should be present in the inventory, uh, through the self-financing equation, we show that um, this is also true for the wealth. And therefore we do tests on the wealth as well and conclude uh, the exact same thing, but with the different um, diffusion process. And then we're like, well, we have this result. And I was very interested in optimal execution throughout my PhD. Uh, so we proposed a, a revamped execution, optimal execution framework, uh, we solve it. And then we, just for fun, we decide to compare it to a real trader, uh, in this case, Citadel, uh, to see how our Monte Carlo simulations, given this model, would compare to what they're doing in real life. So brace yourselves. Uh, these are just a few related references. So in optimal execution, we have huge literature going back more than 20 years. Um, we're using mainly Cartier and Jaimungal here, which is uh, 
a continuous time model, uh, very, very used in throughout the industry uh, in different forms, not necessarily uh, the one we're showing here, but there are uh, other advances in the model. We're going to show a further one. Uh, and the other side of lit the literature is actually uh, more statistical, which is based on uh, Atahalia's book uh, with Jacob. So this is high frequency econometrics book. Uh, in these papers, they're mostly interested in checking for continuous component in the price process. So continuous component meaning the diffusion part. Uh, they also have tests for jumps, but we're not going to go into that in this talk. And also, we're not interested in the price process, we're interested in the inventory process. And here, uh, they also only use regular um, tests for the data. We do also uh, the asynchronous tests for the data, which is just an adjustment, um, which I'm actually not going to go into in this talk because it's very technical, but it's in the paper in case you're interested. So first of all, the motivation. We have inventory data and historically, uh, when we model the inventory process, it's just dqt equals nu t dt. So the, the change in the inventory is the speed of trading times uh, how much time has elapsed. And given that formula, the, we would think, well, this is a smooth function of time. Right? But, but that's not the case as we see in, the, in these plots. So this is, this is to the bare eyes, very obviously uh, stochastic, right? So here's the inventory process and here's the increment in that process intraday. And here we're getting Royal Bank of Canada, which is one stock in the Toronto Stock Exchange. And we're getting Citadel's inventory uh, on a given day. And all days look uh, not exactly the same, but the same type of uh, very, very stochastic uh, looking process. So this is our motivation. And now we're gonna test. So we have our statistical model in which we assume that the inventory is gonna evolve according to a drift term plus a diffusion term. And we wanna, test whether this diffusion term should be here or not. So we define the characteristics of the, the semi-martingale uh, in, in these two ways, but we're mostly interested about this CT term, which is related to the diffusion. So our objective here is to test the null hypothesis that C capital T, so the integral from zero to capital T here, is equal to zero. Why? So C here is the volatility. And this, of course, is a positive value. So if we can show that this integral is zero, it means that each one of them is zero. Therefore, this term should not be here. So if we reject the null hypothesis that C capital T is zero, we're actually saying, well, this term should be here. Okay, and the alternative hypothesis is that um, T capital T is positive. So to sum up the idea, uh, we have a null hypothesis that says the Brownian motion should not be used to model this process. And we're gonna reject the null to say, no, actually we're using that. Okay. Laura, so I, have, I have a quick question on that, if you don't mind. Um, so this uh, this this increment DW is this um, sort of correlated with the with the price of the stock or is it an independent uh, variable? So in the in our case, it's not correlated. Uh, we did not test for the correlation, but you could easily model it um, as a correlated as the two processes having correlated Brownian motions. And, okay, and lastly, the the um, in the execution part this would not make a difference in terms of the functional form of the control. It would make a difference in terms of the actual paths that, that result from, from the equation. Okay, thank you. Sure. Uh, 
So as a first statistical test, we add a fictitious ground in motion to the process. And in this case, we're subsampling the data at regular time intervals. So in the case we're gonna show, I'm gonna show is five minutes, but the results are the same for one minute, 10 minutes. Um, if you make it uh, larger, let's say one hour, uh, it's the statistical test, test become shaky because you don't have like that much data. But for, but for smaller increments, uh, you're good to go. Uh, we truncate the data uh, at a level UN. And this is to exclude jump processes. So as I mentioned before, in the literature, we have both continuous components and discontinuous ones, which are the jumps. Uh, we're not testing for those here. So we truncate the data to focus on the continuous part. So we define the truncated realized volatility of the process uh, as the sum of the increments squared. And this is just uh, an indicator function to say that we're only considering uh, the values that are truncated. And we define its associated corticity, which is the same formula, but uh, to the power of four. And with this, we can define the test statistics whose convergence is uh, stable to normal zero one. So given that, we have uh, our one-sided uh, rejection region. And what we noticed as we were doing this experiment is that for some values of um, the artificial, um, the fictitious Brownian motion that we added, uh, for some values, we reject the null hypothesis, meaning the gradient motion should be there. And for other values, we cannot distinguish uh, the fictitious Brownian motion from uh, the, the component of the process itself. So for small values, it's very clear that we can distinguish the two. For higher values, it's not so clear. And the same is true for uh, the truncation level influenced by gamma. So here you can think of um, if we are three or more uh, standard deviations away, um, then we will reject the null hypothesis and therefore conclude that we should have uh, this Brownian motion component. Otherwise, we can't really distinguish um, the, the, the process uh, with the drift from the process with the diffusion from jump. So it gets uh, a bit messy. So um, we want this truncation level to be reasonably wide as well. And then uh, once we pick uh, intermediary values, so we get gamma equals three and um, uh, if I remember well as 700 for uh, sigma prime. We get, uh, we get the rejection region um, for these. And then we calculate how many days uh, do we conclude that we should have a quadratic variation inventory. So for how many days um, do, should we be modeling the inventory, including the Brownian motion component? And the result is overwhelming. So here we have, uh, active stocks in Toronto Stock Exchange, so very liquid stocks. And we have active traders, uh, meaning it's not uh, you and me trading, placing one order every three months. This is a trader that is actively trading throughout the day. So they're trading 30 times, 50, 100 times a day uh, on the same stock. And the reason why it's not 100% uh, for all the days, we actually went into the data. And the reason is that on some days, the traders not actually trading that much. So even though they're active and the stock is liquid, sometimes something happens that they trade once, twice in a day, and then the, the statistical test fails. So this is what we're seeing here. And I wanted to be completely honest about like, well, this is why uh, it's failing and it's important to know. Um, but overall, the result is quite good. The trader's inventory process should be modeled, including a Brownian motion component. 
And this is true uh, if we do, in this case, I'm showing the regularly sampled uh, data, but the, sa the same table is true with different values, but very high uh, for the asynchronous, uh, asynchronously sampled data um, for both the, the inventory process and the well. So the results are all very similar in terms of saying, well, we should very clearly be using this component. So then we want to look at uh, a new way of modeling optimal execution. So this is the classic Cartier-Jamungo model, which is like uh, widely used in the industry. Uh, in this case, of course, it's a toy model. We could make it so much better. We could uh, improve this diffusion term. We, of course, we could make uh, these two processes correlated. We could add uh, jumps in the price. We could test for jumps uh, in the inventory. Uh, we could make uh, permanent market impact, temporary market impact have more realistic um, shapes. But overall, this, this model, the structure of it is very common to see. Uh, here, what we're doing is we're getting a toy model and we're adding uh, what we're arguing should be there, right? So we're adding the diffusion process in the inventory. And given the self-financing equation, we're also adding uh, a diffusion process for the well. Okay, so um, we have a new setup, which is a progression from the cartain Jaimonte setup. And then we're going to solve it. Uh, I'm not going to go into details of the theoretical solution, but we use uh, maximum principle. Um, so we're solving this backward stochastic differential equation. And we find the optimal control. So this is um, when we're maximizing a stochastic optimization problem, this is what we want to find. So the optimal control. And the optimal control is uh, a function of time. And in this case, the state variable Q, which is only the inventory. And here, if, if you're more familiar with optimal execution, you'll notice that uh, it has the same linear structure as uh, the classic setup of Bertin Jaimungo. And the reason is that um, we don't have in, these new, in, in this new term here, we don't have new t. So new t is our control. And it's not being uh, an influence in the diffusion term. And therefore, it will not, uh, it will not result in, in a change in the optimization problem itself. What it will result in is the change in the path. So since it's a linear function of q, and q is now stochastic, um, the path will also uh, include this change. So the formula looks complicated, but it's very easy to code. <laughs> so don't be scared about this. Um, and then we're, we're going to simulate some, um, some scenarios based on this model. So let me just ask, is, is everyone comfortable with this model, or should I explain um, what each uh, variable means and David, you know, you know um, the crowd better than I do. Well, I, I can't, I can't speak for them, obviously, but this, it does look like, um, you know, you're having some kind of terminal value and you've got a uh, cost for, um, you know, this quadratic variation component, yes. right? So and you've got basically a quadratic form, which gives you the, um, the nice, uh, the solution with the nice linear properties. Yeah, so I, I think you, you got uh, the gist, but maybe for the students, I'll, I'll just go over it really quick. So we, we are maximizing the expected value of the terminal uh, wealth of the agent. So this is the wealth in cash, plus we assume that we can sell our inventory at the end of the trading day for whatever price there is. So this is a rather uh, strong assumption that uh, it's not always possible to have. And then we have two uh, penalty terms. One 
for holding inventory at the end of the trading day. So uh, we want, our trader wants to have QT at the end of the day. And if we're far away from that objective, we get penalized in a quadratic way. This quadratic uh, part is also um, a, a question for debate in the literature. Uh, in another paper, we have this equal three over two, which is a bit more realistic. And then we have a running penalty term, which penalizes not reaching the target throughout the trading day. So, so, so as to force the agent to execute throughout the day. And then uh, the price process, uh, the speed of trading impacts the drift on, with a permanent market impact and has a diffusion term here. Uh, this could be made more realistic. Uh, we could get this directly from real data. Uh, in this case, we're doing Monte Carlo. Uh, the inventory process is being affected by how much you're trading. So the faster you trade, the more you're, you're gonna uh, accumulate inventory. And we now have this diffusion term. And the wealth, this, uh, this is actually an interesting point. The wealth, we're starting from the midpoint here. So ST is the midpoint process. And we're crossing the spread each time and having a temporary market impact. So here, we're implicitly assuming that we have market orders and we're crossing the spread. So we're, we're not passive. Uh, so we're not using limit orders. We're directly execute, executing by crossing the spread. So this is important. Um, okay, so then we solve the problem and we're like, well, let's do a fun experiment for a change. Let's pick a day. So we're actually picking two days, one in which the agent is ex executing a very large order. So this is the perfect framework for optimal execution. The agent wants to execute in one way and it will go there and do it. And the other one is, we, I actually added this in the interest of um, intellectual honesty. This is a day on which the agent starts and ends the trading day with more or less the same inventory. So we're gonna, and, and this is Citadel that we're getting. So we're gonna see that uh, for some days they're actually acting more like a, a hedge fund and some days they're actually acting more like a market maker. And we pick a stock, which is again, Royal Bank of Canada. And we note the times, prices, and volumes of the trades for this stock. And with that, we compute the series of the inventory and the series of the wealth, which would be like, uh, given how much we bought or sold at a given price, how much is the resulting wealth? And here's where it gets interesting for each, um, of a large number of Monte Carlo scenarios. So we do 10,000, uh, but you could do any randomly high number. Uh, we compute the op optimal changes in inventory given two approaches. One, uh, we assume the trade could be done at the price that was actually traded. So here we're getting the price directly from tick data and not using the dynamics in the model. And in approach two, we use the dynamics in the model, meaning uh, this equation here. So, and we're gonna see how, how much uh, they differ versus uh, how much the agent, how well the agent is doing uh, against these two approaches. And with a reminder that this uh, is a, is a time model and the agent is trading in real time and knows their intentions. So for each simulation, we generate an IID normal zero one variable, which is our, uh, it's gonna represent our uh, diffusion term here. Uh, we use, and now we're changing for asynchronous uh, increments, but of course with this formula, they could easily be regularly sampled for the increments uh, DWT. So for those not so familiar, we're substituting the continuous DW tilde T by this term, um, which is in discrete time. So we're implicitly discretizing the problem so that we can code it up, right? 
And then for each simulation, uh, we take the formulas we had before, but now in discrete time. So uh, we have the inventory being the previous inventory plus the speed of trading at a given time step plus our now discrete uh, Monte Carlo generated diffusion term. Uh, where the speed of trading is calculated by that complicated formula resulting from the problem. And here we're skipping the price process and going directly to the wealth, where instead of having, if you remember, uh, here we had the price as a price plus a temporary market impact term. Here, since we're getting the price directly from the data, this is the price on which the trade was executed, meaning we have already crossed the spread if we had to cross the spread. So this is the actual price we see in the data. Same thing here. Uh, and then for each of these, uh, for each time step, we take, uh, we plot a vertical line, which is the interval between uh, the fifth percentile and the 95th percentile of the inventory process. And we do the same thing for the wealth. So we're gonna have uh, a, a region for which uh, we have these uh, processes ranging to and from, right? And then the easiest statistics co to compute is the terminal wealth of the agent. So we're gonna compare how much Citadel uh, spent to buy some stock versus how much uh, the Monte Carlo simulations spent to buy the stock. And for approach two, we have same thing, but now the price process follows uh, the, the dynamics that we defined. So price is the previous price plus uh, permanent market impact times um, speed of trading times how much time elapsed plus the diffusion uh, for the price. And then now we actually see the wealth equation coming up as mid price plus crossing the spread. And we do the same thing, plot intervals and compute the average terminal wealth. So here are the, the numerical results. First for a day where we executed a large order. So we define that the agent is going towards executing what they wanted to execute. So we have a strong assumption here that whatever the agent did is what they wanted to do, which is not always true because uh, the price could move against them. But since we don't have intention data, we don't know a priori what they wanted to do, uh, this is the best we can do with this data. So what we're doing here is like, we are starting from minus 87,000 stocks and we're gonna buy throughout the day until we reach the final goal. And you notice here, uh, we put Citadel in red and the Monte Carlo intervals uh, in, in blue and we just plotted some, some of these paths uh, to compare with the trader. So two things um, jump out from here, one, is that indeed the trader seems to be having um, in in the in the inventory process we see that it's not um, a smooth function so we do have this diffusion component which is good however uh, our model is not taking into account everything that the trader uh, is so here what it looks like is that they're trading uh, VWAP algo and since at the end of the trading day there's auction activity um, and they need to execute the rest of their um, target they're accelerating the trade so here they're trading in steps while our model does not consider that so here um, for our next paper we'll probably change the goal from uh, executing with the target to executing with volume targets as in a V1. But this for future work, I just wanted to be uh, very clear here uh, on what are the advantages and the differences. And then the wealth goes in the opposite direction. So uh, as we're buying inventory, we're spending money to buy. Uh, 
uh, and these are the these are just differences between the price processes with the same seed. So the price is impacting the execution, but overall um, the interval region is, is very similar. Uh, this is where it's easier to see. So for approach one, so this bar here is the trader. So how much they spend at the end of the day. Uh, these are uh, KDE, so, so kernel density estimators for the distribution of the terminal wealth. And we see that for approach two, it's slightly uh, tilted to the right, meaning we're spending less money uh, to actually trade the same stocks. So uh, meaning if we consider the, the price dynamics um, in the problem we defined, instead of the price that the traders saw um, in the book, we would get better execution. So this, this doesn't mean that much. Uh, and then we look at a different trading day. So on this day, this trader started and finished the day with more or less the same inventory, meaning they could have been sitting at home and not spending money at all. Uh, but in this case, since we're using an optimal execution setup, our algo basically didn't do much. So it traded what a thousand stocks uh, and then you know, bought and then sold or sold and then bought. It, it didn't do much, it just did something uh, because it didn't really have the target of execution. Meanwhile, the trader in red uh, is trading six times more. Uh, for a given time of the day. So here, what we think they're doing is acting as market makers. Uh, and even so, they're, what seems to be going on is that the price moved against them and they had to change their mind uh, and execute in a different direction. So meaning, conclusion here is that the model is very good for uh, when the trader knows uh, that they want to trade in one direction. However, if they don't have that goal, it's, it's not really what we should be looking at. So we should, probably should be looking at market making models instead. And the wealth evolution is symmetric. Um, and here uh, is the same KDE, but the trader is now making uh, is now spending uh, more money than any other approach. So meaning it may be because their goal was not that of execution, but also if they didn't want to do much, they should have not done anything at all and not spend money like this. So that's the conclusion. Uh, what we did here was statistical tests for the absence of Brownian motion on both regular and asynchronous data for both inventory and wealth processes. And the reason why we did that is because we saw on the data that there was some component missing. Um, and then we proposed uh, an optimal execution framework that now considers uh, the diffusion term, so the quadratic variation inventories. We solved it using Contreagin's maximum principle. And we did this fun experiment to compare Monte Carlo simulations of this model with the traders' uh, real execution. On both a day that they were actually trading uh, in one direction and uh, when they were just being market makers and not really um, trading large quantities. So thank you. <laughs> you can find this paper on archive and you can email me anytime. Thanks. Well, thank you very much. That was great. And I've, I have to say, I've, I've met thousands of academics in my life, but rarely do you find one that ends a presentation early when they get a chance to keep on uh, talking, but you've, uh, you've made all your major points. So congratulations. Thank you. Um, I have a few questions myself, but are there any questions from the audience that we, we have some time to uh, answer? Um, yes, I, I have one question uh, for Laura. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
Hi, um, so I, I know you mentioned at the beginning, this is like one chapter, you know, in your bigger work. So um, can you just like describe briefly, you know, how does this fit into, you know, kind of like the bigger picture? Yes, yeah, so I have two chapters in my thesis about optimal execution. This is the second one. The first one actually started with Dr. Uh, Njai Mongol uh, with the, the classic optimal execution problem, but we were solving that problem for using neural networks. So, so yeah, it, the problem started to become more realistic uh, the more we looked at the data and saw that things were missing on the model. Um, but yeah, it's, it started out with uh, using the neural network as a universal approximator and finding the solution to this stochastic optimization problem um, by approximating the control, which is the solution by a neural network. And then since networks, neural networks are considered black boxes, we can't really trade with them uh, with impunity, right? Uh, we need to justify to risk sectors uh, and regulators uh, how much risk we're putting on. So we, we went through a route of explainability in machine learning, and we proposed um, that we should um, project the neural network solution, so the neural network control on a lower dimensional manifold, which is uh, the classic one generated by uh, Cartier and Jai-Mongol. Uh, and that is done in a simple way. So it, it's just a, a linear regression because um, this problem here, sorry, I'll just go back. Uh, because this, this problem here, this control is linear in the inventory. So given that we already knew that, we could just use uh, the linear regression. Uh, and then um, the other problem with the neural networks is that uh, they take a long time to train. So what we did is um, instead of having A and phi, these are risk aversion parameters as fixed uh, and having to retrain the network each time we change risk aversion parameters, we instead use them as inputs. So we only have to train them once or once every uh, certain amount of months. And on a given trading day, it's just plug and play. So we just start trading. So I, I think I, I, <laughs> I went too far with explaining, but yeah, that's the overview. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so you, you mentioned that it was a fun experiment to compare with the traders, but what would be even more fun would be to get rid of human traders. So what um, what is your conclusion about uh, you know replacing human traders? Oh yeah, this is not a human trader actually. So this this is an automated trading ah. algo. Yeah, so so this this red red line is an automated trading algo from Citadel. Uh, and what we believe they're doing here is, is just following a VWAP because of these uh, this stairs uh, shape, right? And here at the end, um, they're either accelerating because they didn't finish the VWAP uh, target or they're just, um, executing the higher volume traded at. So the way it works like in microstructure at the end of the trading day, about 15% of the intraday volume is traded um, either in the closing auctions, uh, both in NYSE and NASDAQ or uh, in the open market, but simultaneously. So people need to close out their inventories for the day um, and and reach their targets for, for trading. For example, if they have an alpha that says that they should, like from their portfolio optimization, they should trade this given amount, they need to do it intraday. And at the end, if they're not done, they just need to speed it up. So they have these two venues from auction and open market competing. Um, and, and of course, this model doesn't take uh, 
this into account. It's just, um, we're just focusing on, well, let's execute and let's have a penalty uh, for not executing, which is why it's a lot more, uh, you don't see this these steps here. You don't see uh, it accelerating at the end of the day because it's just, it is executing throughout the day. Um, yeah, so so this is not, yeah, just to say this is not one person trading. Uh, although, although for like, um, for more illiquid stocks, these these are extremely liquid stocks. These are like top 10 liquid stocks in Toronto Stock Exchange. But for very illiquid stocks, you cannot have an algorithm trading because they will be uh, squeezed out in terms of liquidity. It's very easy to game these algorithms uh, if, if there's not enough liquidity. But for very liquid stocks, um, 85% uh, of the trades are actually algos. So yeah, <laughs> it's, it's, okay. very, it's very dominating. All right, uh, thank you, Karen, for that question. Uh, any other questions in the, uh, in the audience? Well, I have a few I can fill the time while others think of their, their questions. Um, Ken basically asked the question I was going to ask you, and you answered it to say that these are um, high frequency trading uh, results. But I was very curious about the other graph you showed on page 18 uh, for, for uh, March 25th. Because if I read this correctly, it looks like the, the day opens with a, with a massive sale, which more, looks more like a human trader trying to spoof the market to me. I'm wondering if I'm interpreting that correctly. No, so it's, it's not necessarily... At Citadel, we know it's not a, a human trader, except on tax, uh, and not and not even that. It's, but like, on, they only trade with an act like a manager going in there uh, if there's something very wrong in 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 terms of data, which doesn't seem to be the case here since they didn't call it trading, uh, or if there is a. a a tax events like uh, dividends are coming up and they don't want to pay those taxes on the dividends. So they'll, but here it also doesn't seem to be like that because they didn't stop trading afterwards. So, so what happened here is probably there was um, volume in the open auction and they, they had some alpha and they executed based on that. And then after they did that, they just, didn't have any more signals to trade. So they're kind of just doing market making strategies until they actually have uh, around 2 p.m. another type of execution strategy going on. So so when you say a market making strategy, you mean an absence of an execution based strategy? Yes, yes. You're just making money on the spread. So just buying, selling, money stuff. Uh, so this is like, we're looking at limit orders. They're on both sides of the book, just making the spread and, and making market for people who want to trade. So they change uh, inventory very little, like 2000 here, 2000 there, um, but they're not uh, in one direction. Okay. I do have another question, but I'd like to give the audience a chance to, uh, to ask as well. Okay, um, I, um, I kind of see your papers being, um, you know, a very, very um, interesting, very clever and descriptive of you know, these types of processes and how to measure this, this kind of, uh, these kinds of factors. But I was wondering in the, in the back of my head, is there some um, prescriptive content? And there seemed to be little hints throughout the presentation that there were some prescriptive ideas. Like when you show the, the different wealth distributions, for example, but I also imagine applications where you might Say use um, you have some kind of way to design a, um, a high frequency trading algorithm that that changed, you know, itself when certain market conditions took place or something like that. So I'm wondering what you're thinking about any kind of prescriptive, um, you know, applications of this um, of this uh, work. Yeah, this this is perfectly possible. 
what we would do is to uh, tweak either the objective function or the dynamics here. And then of course the model would change completely. If we wanna take into account um, liquidity um, in terms of like, well, the volume being available uh, in, in let's say even level two order book data, which means uh, we're not just getting the best bid and the best ask, we're also getting other price levels with their respective quantities. Uh, what we would do is actually um, have a better estimate of alpha and kappa. What we did for this specific paper was, uh, was rescale alpha and kappa. Uh, we did not use it as a constant. We used it rescaled by spread, like average bin spread and the average bin volume. So intraday, we divide the day into 78 five minute bins. And then we take the average of the spread and the average of the volume in each of these bins for a given number of days in the past. And then uh, we rescale these constants to, to take into account intraday activity. What you could do um, is actually have like liquidity aware algo. So, so this, this, what I just mentioned is a very easy way to tweak for intraday liquidity, but you could also have a different modeling in terms of, well, what if this is not the mid price? What if I'm modeling uh, the bid separate from the ask and having them uh, have, for example, like uh, correlated diffusion terms, right? So we could have that, or we could just model the spread separately. The, there, there are a lot of ways that we can grow this model to make it more realistic. And then what we lose is the ability of solving it in closed form. So solving it, like having a formula for it because the, the PD becomes very extense, uh, extensive and, and the, the solution itself sometimes does, does not, uh, it's just not in closed form. You can do approximations of the PD and you can do, uh, like I did in the first paper, you can directly do the neural network approximation for the stochastic optimization problem. Um, but yeah, so, so the liquidity itself would be taken um, into account given estimations that you do, like um, how much volume are you actually seeing. Um, in, you, in the US, uh, this becomes a little bit more involved because we don't have only one stock exchange. So it's not like, one stock is only on NYSE or only on NASDAQ. Um, you have stocks being traded throughout uh, 10, more than 10 different lit exchanges, meaning we can see the order book plus uh, over 60 dark pools. So whenever you wanna send an order, you can actually route your order to many different um, liquidity pools. Uh, which adds to the complexity a bit. Um, so then you would have like um, liquidity seeking algo that would be uh, going around the exchanges or and sometimes placing and canceling orders very fast. Um, yeah, I think I overspoke again, but <laughs> this, this I hope answers the question. I, I think it's it's great to have a sense of where the where the work uh, could go and. And be interesting to see uh, where it actually does go. I think you have a basis for, for a very interesting uh, research plan for the next several years. Yeah, the, the interesting thing is, um, so the next thing that I find interesting is actually uh, studying fill probabilities. So a model for that would be very, very useful for the industry because when you're routing um, your orders through the different exchanges, you very often you don't see the liquidity that's available to you. Very often when you send an order, you create that liquidity, um, sort of like Say's law, like every, um, every offer generates a demand kind of thing. Um, every supply generates a demand. Sorry, I translated from Portuguese. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, so this type of model would be very interesting, I'd say. Yeah. Okay, that's uh, terrific. Any, any other questions from the audience? 
Well, feel free to ask anything uh, at all about market microstructure. I really enjoy this topic. So. <laughs> It's certainly good practice for the job market. Uh, so, so hopefully we can help you in that way at least. <laughs> yes. Okay, last chance for any questions because I'm uh, I'm going to uh, perform an unprecedented act and uh, and end this before the hour is up. But uh, thank you very much because our time was used very efficiently and I think is a very clear explanation of the uh, of the of the problem and the solution. Thank uh, you. Very impressive work. Thank you so much for for uh, allowing us to share with you. Thanks very much for having me. It's a pleasure. All right. Okay, so um, I guess we'll 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 um, we'll end the session there. Um, I will take this opportunity to announce. I think some of you are already aware, um, but on June second to fourth, um, we're going to be um, we're going to be running a um, a conference in uh, in honor of Peter Carr. Uh, there will also be a um, an agreement with the Journal of Derivatives, a commitment to uh, publish proceedings volume. Uh, and to publish papers for selected presenters at that conference. Um, announcements will be going out shortly, but please uh, keep checking with us. Uh, we do have, I think, probably most of the email addresses of people on this uh, this call uh, in our files currently, but keep your eye open for that. And we're looking to, um, I think, attract an international crowd. Uh, the conference will start uh, probably on June 2nd, uh, which is a Thursday evening at five o'clock with a with memorial um, with memorials from uh, several top uh, top academics and professionals who've worked with with Peter, uh, so I look forward to seeing a lot of you there and the department's working working actively to get a, a good event. So uh, make sure if you're interested that you let us know early, uh, and uh, there could be ways for you to participate in this this event as well. Thank you, definitely join. Okay, thank you so much to uh, to everyone in attending, and we'll see you again uh, next week. I always forget to get the next speaker, but Zachary is very good about sending out the. Um, about it's, sending out the uh, information for everyone. I look forward to seeing you uh, next week. Yeah, it's Ro it's Rosa last next week. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, Zara. All right, you take care. You too. Have a great okay. day.